basic concepts in homeostasis. In the 18th and 19th centuries, a series of eminent scientists laid the foundations of our understanding of homeostasis and the response to injury. The classical concepts of homeostasis and the response to injury are The stability of the milieu interior is the primary condition for freedom and independence of existence, Claude Bernard, i.e. body systems act to maintain internal constancy. Homeostasis, the coordinated physiological process which maintains most of the steady states of the organism, Walter Cannon, i.e. complex homeostatic responses involving the brain, nerves, heart, lungs, kidneys, and spleen work to maintain body constancy. There is a circumstance attending accidental injury which does not belong to the disease, namely that the injury done, has in all cases a tendency to produce both the deposition and means of cure, John Hunter, i.e. responses to injury are, in general, beneficial to the host and allow healing slash survival. In essence, the concept evolved that the constancy of the milieu interior allowed for the independence of organisms, that complex homeostatic responses sought to maintain this constancy, and that within this range of responses were the elements of healing and repair. These ideas pertain to normal physiology and mild-slash-moderate injury. In the modern era, such concepts do not account for disease evolution following major injury-slash-sepsis or the injured patient who would have died but for artificial organ support. Such patients exemplify less of the classical homeostatic control system, signal detector processor effector regulated by a negative feedback loop, and more of the open loop system whereby only with medical-slash-surgical resolution of the primary abnormality is a return to classical homeostasis possible. As a consequence of modern understanding of the metabolic response to injury, elective surgical practice seeks to reduce the need for a homeostatic response by minimizing the primary insult, minimal access surgery and stress-free perioperative care. In emergency surgery, where the presence of tissue trauma slash sepsis slash hypovolemia often compounds the primary problem, there is a requirement to augment artificially homeostatic responses, resuscitation, and to close the open loop by intervening to resolve the primary insult, e.g. surgical treatment of major abdominal sepsis, and provide organ support, critical care, while the patient comes back to a situation in which homeostasis can achieve a return to normality. The Graded Nature of the Injury Response It is important to recognize that the response to injury is graded, the more severe the injury, the greater the response, figure 1.1. This concept not only applies to physiological-slash-metabolic changes but also to immunological changes-slash-sequelae. Thus, following elective surgery of intermediate severity, there may be a transient and modest rise in temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, energy expenditure, and peripheral white cell count. Following major trauma slash sepsis, these changes are accentuated, resulting in a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, hypermetabolism, marked catabolism, shock, and even multiple organ dysfunction, MODS. It is important to recognize that genetic variability plays a key role in determining the intensity of the inflammatory response. Moreover, in certain circumstances, the severity of injury does not lead to a simple dose-dependent metabolic response, but rather leads to quantitatively different responses. Not only is the metabolic response graded, but it also evolves with time. In particular, the immunological sequelae of major injury evolve from a pro-inflammatory state driven primarily by the innate immune system, macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells, into a compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome, CARS, characterized by suppressed immunity and diminished resistance to infection. In patients who develop infective complications, the latter will drive ongoing systemic inflammation, the acute phase response and continued catabolism. Mediators of the Metabolic Response to Injury The classical neuroendocrine pathways of the stress response consist of afferent nociceptive neurons, the spinal cord, thalamus, hypothalamus, and pituitary, figure 1.2. Corticotrophin releasing factor, CRF, released from the hypothalamus increases adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH, release from the anterior pituitary. ACTH then acts on the adrenals to increase the secretion of cortisol. 
Hypothalamic activation of the sympathetic nervous system causes release of adrenaline and also stimulates release of glucagon. Intravenous infusion of a cocktail of these counter-regulatory hormones, glucagon, glucocorticoids, and catecholamines, reproduces many aspects of the metabolic response to injury. There are, however, many other players, including alterations in insulin release and sensitivity, hypersecretion of prolactin and growth hormone, GH, in the presence of low circulatory insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, and an activation of peripheral thyroid hormones and gonadal function. Of note, GH has direct lipolytic, insulin antagonizing, and pro-inflammatory properties. The innate immune system, principally macrophages, interacts in a complex manner with the adaptive immune system, T-cells, B-cells, in CO generating the metabolic response to injury, figure 1.2. Pro-inflammatory cytokines including interleukin-1, IL-1, 2 more necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, IL-6 and IL-8 are produced within the first 24 hours and act directly on the hypothalamus to cause pyrexia. Such cytokines also augment the hypothalamic stress response and act directly on skeletal muscle to induce proteolysis while inducing acute phase protein production in the liver. Pro-inflammatory cytokines also play a complex role in the development of peripheral insulin resistance. Other important pro-inflammatory mediators include nitric oxide, novia inducible nitric oxide synthetase INOS, and a variety of prostanoids via cyclooxygenase 2 COX-2. Changes in organ function, e.g. renal hypoperfusion slash impairment, may be induced by excessive vasoconstriction via endogenous factors such as endothelin-1. Within hours of the upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, endogenous cytokine antagonists enter the circulation, e.g. interleukin-1 receptor antagonist IL-1RA and TNF-soluble receptors TNF-SR55 and 75, and act to control the pro-inflammatory response. A complex further series of adaptive changes includes the development of a Th2-type counter-inflammatory response, regulated by IL-4, 5, 9, and 13 and transforming growth factor beta-TGF-beta, which, if accentuated and prolonged in critical illness, is characterized as the CARS and results in immunosuppression and an increased susceptibility to opportunistic, nosocomial, infection. Within inflamed tissue the duration and magnitude of acute inflammation as well as the return to homeostasis are influenced by a group of local mediators known as specialized pro-resolving mediators, SPM, that include essential fatty acid-derived lipoxins, resolvins, protectins, and mersins. These endogenous resolution agonists orchestrate the uptake and clearance of apoptotic polymorphonuclear neutrophils and microbial particles, reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines and lipid mediators as well as enhancing the removal of cellular debris in the inflammatory milieu. Thus, both at the systemic level, endogenous cytokine antagonists see above, and at the local tissue level, the body attempts to limit slash resolve inflammation driven dyshomeostasis there are many complex interactions among the neuroendocrine cytokine and metabolic axes for example although cortisol is immunosuppressive at high levels it acts synergistically with il6 to promote the hepatic acute phase response acth release is enhanced by pro-inflammatory cytokines and the noradrenergic system the resulting rise in cortisol levels may form a weak feedback loop attempting to limit the pro-inflammatory stress response. Finally, hyperglycemia may aggravate the inflammatory response via substrate overflow in the mitochondria, causing the formation of excess oxygen-free radicals and also altering gene expression to enhance cytokine production. At the molecular level, the changes that accompany systemic inflammation are extremely complex. In a recent study using network-based analysis of changes in mRNA expression in leukocytes following exposure to endotoxin, there were changes in the expression of more than 3,700 genes with over half showing decreased expression and the remainder increased expression. The cell surface receptors, signaling mechanisms, and transcription factors that initiate these events are also complex, but an early and important player involves the nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B, slash rela family of transcription factors.
A simplified model of current understanding of events within skeletal muscle is shown in Figure 1.3. The metabolic stress response to surgery and trauma, the ebb and flow model. In the natural world, if an animal is injured, it displays a characteristic response, which includes immobility, anorexia, and catabolism. In 1930, Sir David Cuthbertson divided the metabolic response to injury in humans into ebb and flow phases, Figure 1.4 The ebb phase begins at the time of injury and lasts for approximately 24-48 hours. It may be attenuated by proper resuscitation, but not completely abolished. The ebb phase is characterized by hypovolemia, decreased basal metabolic rate, reduced cardiac output, hypothermia, and lactic acidosis. The predominant hormones regulating the ebb phase are catecholamines, cortisol, and aldosterone, following activation of the renin-angiotensin system. The magnitude of this neuroendocrine response depends on the degree of blood loss and the stimulation of somatic afferent nerves at the site of injury. The main physiological role of the ebb phase is to conserve both circulating volume and energy stores for recovery and repair. Following resuscitation, the ebb phase evolves into a hypermetabolic flow phase, which corresponds to SIRS. This phase involves the mobilization of body energy stores for recovery and repair, and the subsequent replacement of lost or damaged tissue. It is characterized by tissue edema, from vasodilatation and increased capillary leakage, increased basal metabolic rate, hypermetabolism, increased cardiac output, raised body temperature, leukocytosis, increased oxygen consumption and increased gluconeogenesis. The flow phase may be subdivided into an initial catabolic phase, lasting approximately 3-10 days, followed by an anabolic phase, which may last for weeks if extensive recovery and repair are required following serious injury. During the catabolic phase, the increased production of counter-regulatory hormones, including catecholamines, cortisol, insulin, and glucagon, and inflammatory cytokines, e.g. IL-1, IL-6 and TNF-alpha, results in significant fat and protein mobilization, leading to significant weight loss and increased urinary nitrogen excretion. The increased production of insulin at this time is associated with significant insulin resistance and, therefore, injured patients often exhibit poor glycemic control. The combination of pronounced or prolonged catabolism in association with insulin resistance places patients within this phase at increased risk of complications. Obviously, the development of complications will further aggravate the neuroendocrine and inflammatory stress responses, thus creating a vicious catabolic cycle. Key Catabolic Elements of the Flow Phase of the Metabolic Stress Response There are several key elements of the flow phase that largely determine the extent of catabolism and thus govern the metabolic and nutritional care of the surgical patient. It must be remembered that, during the response to injury, not all tissues are catabolic. Indeed, the essence of this coordinated response is to allow the body to reprioritize limited resources away from peripheral tissues, muscle, adipose tissue, skin, and towards key viscera, liver, immune system, and the wound. Figure 1.5 Hypermetabolism The majority of trauma patients, except possibly those with extensive burns, demonstrate energy expenditures approximately 15-25% above predicted healthy resting values. The predominant cause appears to be a complex interaction between the central control of metabolic rate and peripheral energy utilization. In particular, central thermodysregulation, caused by the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade, increased sympathetic activity, abnormalities in wound circulation, ischemic areas produce lactate, which must be metabolized by the adenosine triphosphate ADP-consuming hepatic Cori cycle. Hyperemic areas cause an increase in cardiac output, increased protein turnover and nutritional support may all increase patient energy expenditure. Theoretically, patient energy expenditure could rise even higher than observed levels following surgery or trauma, but several features of standard intensive care, including bed rest, paralysis, ventilation, and external temperature regulation, counteract the hypermetabolic driving forces of the stress response. Furthermore, 
the skeletal muscle wasting experienced by patients with prolonged catabolism actually limits the volume of metabolically active tissue, see below. Alterations in Skeletal Muscle Protein Metabolism Muscle protein is continually synthesized and broken down with a turnover rate in humans of 1-2% per day, and with a greater amplitude of changes in protein synthesis, plus or minus twofold, than breakdown, plus or minus 0.25 fold, during the diurnal cycle. Under normal circumstances, synthesis equals breakdown and muscle bulk remains constant. Physiological stimuli that promote net muscle protein accretion include feeding, especially extracellular amino acid concentration, and exercise. Paradoxically, during exercise, skeletal muscle protein synthesis is depressed, but it increases again during rest and feeding. During the catabolic phase of the stress response, muscle wasting occurs as a result of an increase in muscle protein degradation, via enzymatic pathways, coupled with a decrease in muscle protein synthesis. The major site of protein loss is peripheral skeletal muscle, although nitrogen losses also occur in the respiratory muscles, predisposing the patient to hypoventilation and chest infections, and in the gut, reducing gut motility. Cardiac muscle appears to be mostly spared. Under extreme conditions of catabolism, e.g. major sepsis, urinary nitrogen losses can reach 14-20 g-day. This is equivalent to the loss of 500 grams of skeletal muscle per day. It is remarkable that muscle catabolism cannot be inhibited fully by providing artificial nutritional support as long as the stress response continues. Indeed, in critical care, it is now recognized that hyperalimentation represents a metabolic stress in itself, and that nutritional support should be at a modest level to attenuate rather than replace energy and protein losses. The predominant mechanism involved in the wasting of skeletal muscle is the ADP-dependent ubiquitin proteasome pathway, figure 1.6, although the lysosomal cathepsins and the calcium calpane pathway play facilitatory and accessory roles. Clinically, a patient with skeletal muscle wasting will experience asthenia, increased fatigue, reduced functional ability, decreased quality of life and an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. In critically ill patients, Muscle weakness may be further worsened by the development of critical illness myopathy, a multifactorial condition that is associated with impaired excitation contraction coupling at the level of the sarcolemma and the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. Alterations in hepatic protein metabolism, the acute phase protein response. The liver and skeletal muscle together account for 50% of daily body protein turnover. Skeletal muscle has a large mass but a low turnover rate. 1-2% per day, whereas the liver has a relatively small mass, 1.5 kg, but a much higher protein turnover rate, 10-20% per day. Hepatic protein synthesis is divided roughly 50-50 between renewal of structural proteins and synthesis of export proteins. Albumin is the major export protein produced by the liver and is renewed at the rate of about 10% per day. The transcapillary escape rate, TER, of albumin is about 10 times the rate of synthesis, and short-term changes in albumin concentration are most probably due to increased vascular permeability. Albumin term may be increased threefold following major injury slash sepsis. In response to inflammatory conditions, including surgery, trauma, sepsis, cancer, or autoimmune conditions, circulating peripheral blood mononuclear cells secrete a range of pro-inflammatory cytokines including IL-1, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. These cytokines, in particular IL-6, promote the hepatic synthesis of positive acute phase proteins, e.g. fibrinogen and C-reactive protein, CRP. The acute phase protein response, APPR, represents a double-edged sword for surgical patients as it provides proteins important for recovery and repair but only at the expense of valuable lean tissue and energy reserves. In contrast to the positive acute phase reactants, the plasma concentrations of other liver export proteins, the negative acute phase reactants, fall acutely following injury, e.g. albumin. However, rather than representing a reduced hepatic synthesis rate, 
the fall in plasma concentration of negative acute phase reactants is thought principally to reflect increased transcapillary escape, secondary to an increase in microvascular permeability, see above. Thus, increased hepatic synthesis of positive acute phase reactants is not compensated for by reduced synthesis of negative reactants. Insulin resistance Following surgery or trauma Postoperative hyperglycemia develops as a result of increased glucose production combined with decreased glucose uptake in peripheral tissues. Decreased glucose uptake is a result of insulin resistance which is transiently induced within the stressed patient. Suggested mechanisms for this phenomenon include the action of pro-inflammatory cytokines and the decreased responsiveness of insulin-regulated glucose transporter proteins. The degree of insulin resistance is proportional to the magnitude of the injurious process. Following routine upper abdominal surgery, insulin resistance may persist for approximately two weeks. Postoperative patients with insulin resistance behave in a similar manner to individuals with type 2 diabetes mellitus. The mainstay of management of insulin resistance is intravenous insulin infusion. Insulin infusions may be used in either an intensive approach i.e. sliding scales are manipulated to normalize the blood glucose level, or a conservative approach, i.e. insulin is administered when the blood glucose level exceeds a defined limit and discontinued when the level falls. While some studies of postoperatively ventilated patients in the intensive care unit, ICU, have suggested that maintenance of normal glucose levels using intensive insulin therapy can significantly reduce both morbidity and mortality, others have not. The risks of adverse events following significant hypoglycemia as a consequence of intensive insulin therapy have led most ICUs to adopt a more conventional approach to glycemic control. It should be noted that diabetic patients whose glycemic control has been poor prior to their critical illness pose a particular challenge. Changes in body composition following injury The average 70 kg male can be considered to consist of fat, 13 kg, and fat free mass or lean body mass, 57 kg. In such an individual, the lean tissue is composed primarily of protein, 12 kg, water, 42 kg, and minerals, 3 kg, figure 1.7. The protein mass can be considered as two basic compartments, skeletal muscle, 4 kg, and non-skeletal muscle, 8 kg, which includes the visceral protein mass. The water mass, 42 liters, is divided into intracellular, 28 liters, and extracellular, 14 liters, spaces. Most of the mineral mass is contained in the bony skeleton. The main label energy reserve in the body is fat, and the main label protein reserve is skeletal muscle. While fat mass can be reduced without major detriment to function, loss of protein mass results not only in skeletal muscle wasting, but also in depletion of visceral protein status. Within lean issue, each 1 gram of nitrogen is contained within 6.25 grams of protein, which is contained in approximately 36 grams of wet weight tissue. Thus, the loss of 1 gram of nitrogen in urine is equivalent to the breakdown of 36 grams of wet weight lean tissue. Protein turnover in the whole body is of the order of 15200 g per day. A normal human ingests about 7100 g protein per day, which is metabolized and excreted in urine as ammonia and urea, i.e. approximately 14 grams n slash day. During total starvation, urinary loss of nitrogen is rapidly attenuated by a series of adaptive changes. Loss of body weight follows a similar course, figure 1.8, thus accounting for the survival of hunger strikers for a period of 50-60 days. Following major injury, and particularly in the presence of ongoing septic complications, this adaptive change fails to occur, and there is a state of autocannibalism, resulting in continuing urinary nitrogen losses of 1020 gn slash day, equivalent to 500 grams of wet weight lean tissue per day. As with total starvation, once loss of body protein mass has reached 30-40% of the total, survival is unlikely. Critically ill patients admitted to the ICU with severe sepsis or major blunt trauma undergo massive changes in body composition, figure 1.8.
body weight increases immediately on resuscitation with an expansion of extracellular water by 6-10 liters within 24 hours. Thereafter, even with optimal metabolic care and nutritional support, total body protein will diminish by 15% in the next 10 days, and body weight will reach negative balance as the expansion of the extracellular space resolves. In marked contrast, it is now possible to maintain body weight and nitrogen equilibrium following major elective surgery. This can be achieved by blocking the neuroendocrine stress response with epidural analgesia other related techniques and providing early oral enteral feeding. Moreover, the early fluid retention phase can be avoided by careful intraoperative management of fluid balance, with avoidance of excessive administration of intravenous saline. Avoidable factors that compound the response to injury. As noted previously, the main features of the metabolic response are initiated by the immune system, cardiovascular system, sympathetic nervous system, ascending reticular formation and limbic system. However, the metabolic stress response may be further exacerbated by anesthesia, dehydration, starvation, including preoperative fasting, sepsis, acute medical illness or even severe psychological stress, figure 1.9. Attempts to limit or control these factors can be beneficial to the patient. Volume loss During simple hemorrhage, pressor receptors in the carotid artery and aortic arch, and volume receptors in the wall of the left atrium, initiate afferent nerve input to the central nervous system, CNS, resulting in the release of both aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Pain can also stimulate ADH release. ADH acts directly on the kidney to cause fluid retention. Decreased pulse pressure stimulates the juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidney and directly activates the renin-angiotensin system, which in turn increases aldosterone release. Aldosterone causes the renal tubule to reabsorb sodium, and consequently also conserve water. ACTH release also augments the aldosterone response. The net effects of ADH and aldosterone result in the natural oliguria observed after surgery and conservation of sodium and water in the extracellular space. The tendency towards water and salt retention is exacerbated by resuscitation with saline-rich fluids. Salt and water retention can result in not only peripheral edema, but also visceral edema, e.g. in the stomach. Such visceral edema has been associated with reduced gastric emptying delayed resumption of food intake and prolonged hospital stay. Careful limitation of intraoperative administration of balanced crystalloids so that there is no net weight gain following elective surgery has been proven to reduce postoperative complications and length of stay. Hypothermia Hypothermia results in increased elaboration of adrenal steroids and catecholamines. When compared with normothermic controls, even mild hypothermia results in a two- to three-fold increase in postoperative cardiac arrhythmias and increased catabolism. Randomized trials have shown that maintaining normothermia by an upper body forced air heating cover reduces wound infections, cardiac complications, and bleeding and transfusion requirements. Tissue edema During systemic inflammation, fluid, plasma proteins, leukocytes, Macrophages and electrolytes leave the vascular space and accumulate in the tissues. This can diminish the alveolar diffusion of oxygen and may lead to reduced renal function. Increased capillary leak is mediated by a wide variety of mediators including cytokines, prostanoids, bradykinin and nitric oxide. Vasodilatation implies that intravascular volume decreases, which induces shock if inadequate resuscitation is not undertaken. Meanwhile, Intracellular volume decreases, and this provides part of the volume necessary to replenish intravascular and extravascular extracellular volume. Systemic inflammation and tissue under perfusion. The vascular endothelium controls vasomotor tone and microvascular flow, and regulates trafficking of nutrients and biologically active molecules. When endothelial activation is excessive, Compromised microcirculation and subsequent cellular hypoxia contribute to the risk of organ failure. Maintaining normal glycemia with insulin infusion during critical illness has been proposed to protect the endothelium, probably, in part, via inhibition of excessive INOS induced no release. Starvation During starvation, 
the body is faced with an obligate need to generate glucose to sustain cerebral energy metabolism, 100 grams of glucose per day. This is achieved in the first 24 hours by mobilizing glycogen stores and thereafter by hepatic gluconeogenesis from amino acids, glycerol, and lactate. The energy metabolism of other tissues is sustained by mobilizing fat from adipose tissue. Such fat mobilization is mainly dependent on a fall in circulating insulin levels. Eventually, accelerated loss of lean tissue, the main source of amino acids for hepatic gluconeogenesis, is reduced as a result of the liver converting free fatty acids into ketone bodies, which can serve as a substitute for glucose for cerebral energy metabolism. Provision of 2 liters of intravenous 4% dextrose-0. 18% sodium chloride as maintenance intravenous fluids for surgical patients who are fasted provides 80 grams of glucose per day and has a significant protein sparing effect. Avoiding unnecessary fasting in the first instance and early oral slash enteral slash parenteral nutrition form the platform for avoiding loss of body mass as a result of the varying degrees of starvation observed in surgical patients. Modern guidelines on fasting prior to anesthesia allow intake of clear fluids up to two hours before surgery. Administration of a carbohydrate drink at this time reduces perioperative anxiety and thirst and decreases postoperative insulin resistance. Immobility Immobility has long been recognized as a potent stimulus for inducing muscle wasting. Inactivity impairs the normal meal-derived amino acid stimulation of protein synthesis in skeletal muscle. Avoidance of unnecessary bed rest and active early mobilization are essential measures to avoid muscle wasting as a consequence of immobility. Concepts behind enhanced recovery after surgery. Current understanding of the metabolic response to surgical injury and the mediators involved has led to a reappraisal of traditional perioperative care. There is now a strong scientific rationale for avoiding unmodulated exposure to stress, prolonged fasting, and excessive administration of intravenous saline, fluids, figure 1.10. The widespread adoption of minimal access, laparoscopic, surgery is a key change in surgical practice that can reduce the magnitude of surgical injury and enhance the rate of patients return to homeostasis and recovery. It is also important to realize that modulating the stress-slash-inflammatory response at the time of surgery may have long-term sequelae over periods of months or longer. For example, Beta blockers and statins have been shown to improve long term survival after major surgery. It has been suggested that these effects may be due to suppression of innate immunity at the time of surgery. Equally, in open surgery, the use of epidural analgesia to reduce pain, block the cortisol stress response, and attenuate postoperative insulin resistance may, via effects on the body's protein economy, favorably affect many of the patient-centered outcomes that are important to postoperative recovery. Due to the reduction in wound size and tissue trauma, it should be noted that epidural analgesia is no longer recommended for laparoscopic surgery. Patient-controlled analgesia is usually sufficient. Adjuncts such as one-shot spinal diamorphine and slash or a 6-12-hour infusion of intravenous lidocaine have been suggested to be opiate-sparing to improve gut function and enhance overall recovery.